Good afternoon. It's been a couple of days since I recorded, and normally I probably wouldn't record two things within about two days. But September 16th is a little bit special in so far as it is St. Alexander of Munich's birthday. Um, and he was born in 1917, so this would have been his 105th birthday. And he was born on the old calendar, so his birth certificate actually said September 3rd, but his family moved to Germany when he was about three, and the 16th of September it was ever since then. Getting back to the fact that this would be his 105th birthday, <clears throat> there's very little chance that he'd actually be celebrating it today in the flesh, even if he had lived and died a normal, natural death. Um, it's one of the things of life. I mean, sure, there are a few people who do reach the 105th birthday. Um, but it's highly unlikely. However, um, we do remember him, uh, not just his death, but his life, um, because of the witness that he had, and that's important. Um, I have been interested in the life of Alexander Schmorel for over 20 years now. Um, I got to visit Orenburg, Russia, his birthplace, because of it, because of this interest back in 2007, so that was 15 years ago, as crazy as that seems. You know, when you get to be my age, decades, you know, they just seem like nothing, right? Um... But the thing is, is that when I first became aware of Alexander Schmorel, it was because of learning about the White Rose in a German class. And I think up until that point, I didn't know a single other soul who had ever heard of him. Apart from people who really knew about the White Rose. Um, however, in Germany, the focus really is on the Scholl siblings. I believe the first biography of Alexander Schmorel didn't come out until 2000, and it was written by Igor Kramov, and it was done in Russian. Um, and ever since then, there has been growing interest, it seems, especially on the Orthodox side into the life of St. Alexander. And it's a great thing to see. It kind of amazes me, though, because when I started, it seemed like this was kind of a random thing to be interested in his life. Um, and truthfully, I heard of him before I became Orthodox, before I was even really interested in becoming Orthodox, but I thought it was fantastic that he was a member of the White Rose and that he was Russian and he saw what he wanted to do in life as building bridges between peoples and cultures and such, and that was what I wanted to do with my life. The first real time I got interested into the Christian side of this happened to be when I read the book, um, Die Weiße Rosa von dem Front. In I don't remember the title exactly. Um, I will put it in, in the um, description. Um, but it's a book in German about 
the experiences of the male members of the White Rose during the three months that they were stationed out in Russia in the late summer, early fall of 1942, and how that kind of changed the messaging and the tactics of the White Rose. But one of the things that I read in the book was that while they were out there, Alexander Schmorel would seek out parish priests in the places that they were and, and try talking to them to see how things were going. There was a little bit of a thaw in the... Um, insofar as, as it wasn't nearly as outlawed as it had been, to be religious or to, to go to church in the Soviet Union, they allowed a little bit more of that because of World War II and because of the horrible losses and, and destruction that Russia was undergoing. Um, but one of, you know, not only that, as far as the, um, what would you have it, you know, that he was, was seeking out priests to talk to, but he also attended liturgies there, and he brought Hans Scholl and Willy Graf and possibly Jürgen Wittenstein with him. And my mind is absolutely blown by what that must have looked like to have three or four, you know, German, um, soldiers come in and, and participate in divine liturgy. I mean, even Willy Graf, I think, spoke about trying to f like find the Isan and, and sing along with the Isan with, when it came to music. He was, he was a very, very devout Roman Catholic, and he was a very good singer and, and, and things like that, but he was very interested in Russia and Eastern Europe, and he had other good friends who had studied some of this um, and his, his comment afterwards was that um, Alexander really opened his eyes to a lot of things in, in like the Slavic peoples and, and Russians in particular that had, had been a mystery to him before. And he had spent a long time on the Eastern Front, unlike any of the others in the group. And it was kind of a very horrible time for him, just the... the things that he witnessed and, and being out there, um, I think it was Eastern Poland, um, where he had been before. And so I, I am, I'm very happy and I'm very pleased that Alexander has been glorified as a saint. Um, I am humbled um, that his parish actually has an article in English that mentions my name for the little tiny bit that I may be responsible for any, like, just help in, in getting him known more in the English-speaking world. But I think one of the things, I, well, I think he's a very important saint for today. I think he's a very important saint in the West. Um, and that has to do a lot with, he was somebody who was an Orthodox Christian in the West. He was living in a place where Orthodoxy was absolutely in the minority. Even in his family, his father was Protestant, his stepmother was Catholic, his two half-siblings were being raised Catholic. Um, he had a nanny who had traveled with them from Russia, and she was Russian, and his mother had, well, she was Russian, but she was also Orthodox, but his mother was Russian, and she was Orthodox, and some accounts say that she was even the daughter of a priest, but it's been very, very hard to verify that. Um, even though she died when Alex was about a year old, and nobody's quite sure exactly when she died anymore. Um, his nanny took on 
the responsibility of, of keeping him orthodox. And she came with them to Germany, and his stepmother helped finance his instruction in being orthodox, and his, his nanny made sure he actually went. Um, but it wasn't necessarily an easy thing. There is a story about when he was in grade school and in Bavaria, and I think all of Germany at that time, but Bavaria in particular, which is very, very Catholic. <clears throat> he was... Religious instruction was mandatory in the schools, and basically you picked whether you were going to Lutheran or Catholic religious instruction. And he was neither, but he got sent with the Roman Catholics. And he would always cross himself the Orthodox way, right to left. And he had one teacher who took issue with that and said, well, you're our guest here. You should do it our way because that's the way we do it. And, and he absolutely refused. Um, and so he was always like that. And he had friends who were not orthodox. He, had, he was the godparent to his best friend. He was the godparent to one of his friend Christoph Probst's children. And at the time, um, Hertha Probst, Christoph's wife, was Roman Catholic. And, and Christoph was kind of sort of nothing. Um, he did end up getting baptized Catholic at the point of death in February of 1943. Um, but he, Alexander had friends who were Orthodox and that he could, he could be Orthodox with, and that was important. Um, it's also, I think it's also important and, and that he wasn't a monastic, and I'm not dissing monastics at all. It's just that when you talk about monastics being saints, I don't think a lot of people see themselves necessarily as being that holy. And I know monastics would argue with you that they're not holy necessarily, that you know, the greatest sinner of all and everything. But you know, when when you hear stories that I think Saint Seraphim Sarov, if I have this right, didn't drink his mother's milk on, on Wednesdays or Fridays because he was already such a holy person. That is kind of a hard thing to to aspire to, shall we say. And Alexander Schmorell, he was a student. He was a medical student. He was young. He was somebody who had a lot of privilege, you know, as far as today's vernacular goes. His father was a doctor, they were very well off. His house was described as a villa. And a lot of the financing of the White Rose came through the pocket money that Alexander received from his family. And he never told them what he was doing with it. But he could have been somebody who just kept his head down and survived the war and, and gotten a nice job as a doctor or pretty much whatever he wanted to um, after the war um, and he decided that he couldn't do that that his conscience wouldn't allow him to do that and so he stood up <coughs> and I mean he's a very normal person I mean in the English writings about him it's, it's not necessarily mentioned so often, but in the German um, books and things, one of the, what shall we say, issues that was going on was that he was absolutely in love with his best friend's sister. So Christoph's Pope's sister, Angelica, um, he wanted to marry, and he pretty much the only letters that we have from him 
that have survived were letters from him to Angelica, and a lot of them are kind of lovesick puppy letters saying about how much he missed her and how much he wasn't happy without her and how much he wanted to take her to Russia and go horseback riding across the steppes and, and all sorts of things. Um, but as, as somebody mentioned, um, <laughs> you can't necessarily take them 100% at face value. I mean, it was, it was absolutely unquestioned that he had friends and he was popular in Germany. So when he's writing Angelica that he has nobody else to, to talk to or do anything with or whatever he wrote, and it's a little bit of an exaggeration. But Angelica ended up getting married to somebody else. Um, and there is pretty good evidence that the relationship between the two of them didn't end. That, um, you know, there was a physical side to it as well. And that this was one of the things that he was not happy with his stepmother about because he wouldn't listen to her to cut it out and so she eventually ended up going to Angelica to tell her to cut it out. Um, and it's interesting too because he talks about in his letters from prison that how much he's changed, how much he's developed spiritually and um, that he wouldn't even trade places with somebody else, say a, a guard in, in the prison, because he knows that he spoke for the truth and that he needed all these things to happen to be able to develop in the way that God wants us to. And I get, I believe at some point Angelica was shown his letters that came to his family from prison and and she said it, it almost sounded like another person um, and I think that is a, a good lesson for people today I mean it's always a good lesson but he's also somebody who grew up in a time with cars and bicycles and telephones and no not the internet but but definitely modern trappings and and not in the sense of he was in some monastery somewhere it's like no he was a young man and he took advantage of these things because he loved life but when it came down to it he loved God and he loved the truth more than he loved being um, alive and you know, he, he speaks in his letters very much about how he believes in the life to come. And I believe, and this is just my speculation here, that um, he, he was offered some sort of glimpse that there is life after what we see as death. And... Um, that's a very, very important thing to remember. It always is. But to have somebody who is a modern person, who is young, who has, who had the trappings of, of luxury, basically, saying, I am convinced of this, and I acted because I had to, to please God. That is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And kind of as, as we feel like the world is falling apart, I mean, you could imagine living in, in the Third Reich, possibly, where if you said the wrong thing, you could get arrested. If you, you know, there was a war going on, there's all sorts of, of weird sort of pushing of, of boundaries to what was normal and was not normal, and you had kind of the, the, the Nazi thing of 
pushing their own morality on on a people who at that point were still pretty religious and um you know there were certain people who just saw it for what it was and decided to stand up and i mean there weren't very many of them but it's important to remember those who did uh, i am just astounded um in the u.s um that there has been such such a growth in in the following and and um veneration so to speak speak of, of saint alexander i didn't get to go to the glorification ceremony in 2012 um and and there were there were reasons for that. I thought for years and years before that that no matter what I would be there, and I would be the first one. Not not quite, but um, that there was no way that I was not going to attend that. And it just happened that it did not work out. Um, and I'm not. I would have liked to have gone. I'm not going to say that I'm super upset because it, it is the way that it is, and there's no use to. Um, cry about that. I did get to go to Russia in, in 2007 for what would have been Alexander Schmerl's 90th birthday and that was an amazing, amazing experience um, and it was a thing of not just seeing where he was born but putting in part of that um, spiritual part as well which could have been overlooked. I mean, Igor Kramov, who put together the trip, did an, a fantastic job of, of kind of putting together the different parts. Um, yeah, and, and I am humbled that I got to meet one of Alexand Alexander Schmarl's very good friends. Um, and you know, there there were a, a small number of people who got to see him glorified, who knew him personally, and um, Nikolai Hamasaspian, who was on that trip, was one of them. Um, his friend Lilo Fostramdor was still alive at the point, but I don't know that she went to the um, glorification. She's not Orthodox, and she did an interview with a British outlet, um, whether it was a BBC or something else, I don't know. Um, but they, they had a, a big thing in there about, you know, she didn't believe she was a saint. And I mean, of course, it's different when you know somebody, but our, our, our saints are not measured by their sins, they're, they're measured about about what they do to serve God. Um, and God forgives all sorts of things. Um, Trout Le Friends, I don't think she was there either. She, As far as I know, she's still living um, in the US. Um, one of the people that he greeted in his last farewell letter was still living. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, most of them are gone now. Um, I saw his half-brother and sister at an event in 2004. Um, it was actually the, the Panikita, um, the memorial, that they did every year at the Brokor Cathedral in Munich. And there was the, the liturgy, there was the walking over to the cemetery for the Panikita, and then there was a little bit of luncheon back by the church and Eric Schmorel um, spoke a little bit. I think Natalia, his sister, maybe said a couple of words, but it was interesting. I don't know that they were completely on board with the veneration of their older brother. I mean, th this was the person that they grew up with, that 
you know, they had fights with and, you know, they saw up close, close and personal and, and experienced the flaws in, in, in personality in, in, in a way that most other people wouldn't have. But they came and um, Eric Schmorell spoke a little bit about his mother and how she ended up not just being Alexander's um, stepmother, but before she got married, she actually um, met and worked with um, Grand Duchess Elizabeth, who also then became sainted, um, or recognized as a saint in the Orthodox Church. And I thought that was very nice. Um, but she, she was Roman Catholic her whole life. Um, and um, yeah, Eric Schmal is, is really the reason why we have any biography of his brother. Um, him and, and, and Igor Kramov, who did the, the biography in the late 90s, which came out in 2000. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting too now as far as, you know, almost all of these people are gone. Um, Natalia died in, what was that, 2017 or 2019, I'm not sure, and Eric died in... 2005 and you know Alexander wrote that he hoped to see them all again in the next life and and I certainly hope that has happened anyway um, this video ended up being a lot longer than I expected um, but if you get me talking about Alexander Schmoro I literally can talk for hours. Um, he is my favorite saint, the the saint that I feel closest to. He has a huge influence on how I became Orthodox, and I ask for his prayers regularly. Um, Happy birthday. No guy. So, yeah, I I could say many years, but I hope he is remembered for many, many years.